Welcome to Joy for the Journey, a worship service television ministry presented by your friends at the First Baptist Church of Mattoon, Illinois. Well, the kids started us off with a wonderful rendition, so let's see if you can match. Now, we know you can't, but let's see if you can match what the kids did. Please join me in singing Worship Christ the Risen King.
caught in sin remain inside the lie of inward shame but fix our eyes upon the cross and run to him who showed great love and led for us and freely you fled for us Christ is risen from the dead trampling over death by death come awake come awake come and rise up from the grave christ is risen from the dead we are one with him again come awake come awake come and rise up from the Blood and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in.
24, 13 through 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that he had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Easter, the resurrection, should be celebrated and remembered every day, every day, because uh, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ changes everything for us. And it, uh, because of his resurrection, uh, life everlasting is possible for us and to experience the Holy Spirit and the gift of God in our lives each day is possible through the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, would you pray with me? Uh, gracious God, we come before you this day thankful that we serve a risen King, a Savior who took our sins upon himself and rose victorious from the dead so that we, through him, might have life everlasting. Lord, I pray that you would help our minds and our hearts to uh, take a hold of some important truths from this encounter Jesus has with Cleopas and his companion on their way back to Emmaus. And Lord, may we uh, walk away from uh, this service this morning having our eyes opened and having met you, the risen Savior, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there was a teacher uh, who uh, uh, decided that for show and tell, she was going to ask the kids to bring some symbols of uh, their faith experience, their religions. And so uh, one of the kids, uh, he said, my name is David and I am Jewish and this is a menorah and we light these candles in celebration of Hanukkah. And another student, she uh, in indicated that she was Muslim and she brought a, a, a prayer mat and she said, we lay this down and face Mecca and we pray. And another boy uh, said, I'm Joey, this is a casserole, casserole dish and I'm a Baptist. <laughs> it could work if you're a Methodist, it could really work pretty much for any Protestant group. Um, it's a classic joke, and it's one of my favorites, and here's why. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> um, jokes are good when they have a little bit of truth in them, right? And uh, the truth of the matter is, if when we gather, if we're not in the sanctuary for worship, or if we're not gathering like Michael announced uh, that we're going to have business meetings tomorrow night, pretty much every other time we gather, we gather and we do what? We eat, right? We eat. Um, and that tells us actually something important that's true in everyday life because we don't eat simply just for nourishment, but we also eat for enjoyment and for fellowship. And that's not just true in... Uh, church that's true in culture all around the world and a table fellowship getting together with other people and sharing meals and and just sharing life together is is what makes uh relationships solidify uh it really helps uh make people feel apart uh with one another in fact so much that even jesus uh, was accused by the Pharisees because they didn't like who he fellowshiped with because uh, he was known as one who ate with tax collectors and sinners. 
and he wasn't supposed to associate with those kinds of people, according to the Pharisees. And in reality, if, uh, if you want to experience someone's culture, you eat with them, right? You partake of the food that is a part of their culture. And culture and food itself is is universal way of sharing because it's a part of hospitality, right? There's something special about saying, hey, let's get together and we, we share a meal with one another. Uh, because meals are a part of everyday life. And the fact is that Jesus invites us to have him in our everyday lives as well. There's an Anglican uh, a priest from England who uh, uh, named Gregory Dix. He wrote a book in 1941 entitled The Shape of Liturgy. Uh, in other words, uh, he, he, he's writing a book about uh, religious rites and orders of worship. But what he writes about is this pattern that he observed in scripture about how Jesus interacts with people. And in his book, he's not talking about worship itself. He's talking about everyday life. Everyday life with Jesus. And how does Jesus do that? And uh, what he observed is this pattern where food is involved. Jesus does four things. Uh, he, he always, in, in, it involves these things. That Jesus takes, that he blesses that he breaks, and that he gives. And so I'm just going to run through them quickly. They're actually in your outline in the bulletin. Uh, they're highlighted, but you can see these words. The first one from Matthew 14. This is the feeding of the 5,000. This is when Jesus does this miracle and multiplies uh, this, this little boy's meal to feed 5,000 men plus women and children. And uh, the passage says, he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. Then the next one is the feeding of the 4,000 and same pattern Then he took the, the seven loaves of, and the fish and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. Jesus did this very same thing in, uh, in the Passover meal, the Last Supper that he shared with his disciples. And you can read that in Matthew 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And the Apostle Paul gave the very same instructions in 1 Corinthians to the church in their observance of the Lord's Supper. For he said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now Paul leaves out that last word, gave. But Jesus gave the bread, and he passed out the cup to, to everyone. Uh, so the pattern is there. And this is the pattern for life uh, with Jesus. What we're really talking about here is spiritual formation. What we're really talking about is how we can have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and grow in a relationship with him, just like our little ones told us that we're to read our Bibles and pray every day so we can grow, grow, grow. Uh, we, uh, we can have this relationship with the Lord um, as he takes what we give to him, as he blesses it and breaks it and gives it back to us. So we'll just work our way through those four things. Jesus takes what you bring. Now, Cleopas and his companion, most, most scholars think it was probably his wife. We don't have the name for the person, but they go back to one house, uh, and it's probably his wife. What did they give to the Lord, or what did they bring to him? They're on their way back after the devastating news that Jesus 
had died. He was, he was convicted and died a criminal's death on a cross. And uh, he was buried. And now there's news that uh, he's not in the tomb any longer. And they're dejected and uh, downcast. Their world has totally been crushed because they expected that Jesus was going to save them from the Roman Empire. They expected that he was going to uh, create a revolt in which they would no longer have this oppression. Their dr dreams were, were, were crushed. And uh, so much so that they don't even recognize Jesus. They don't see him for who he is. They don't know that that is the one who's come alongside and uh, and has uh, started asking them about the events. Here's the thing, people. I think uh, wrongly many times we think, well, I can only bring to Jesus my best. I can only bring to Jesus once I've got my act together. I can only come to Jesus when everything's squared away. Jesus takes you and me where we are. He receives us where we are. When we have faith to trust him and, and step out and say, I believe you are who you say you are, he receives us. He takes what we give. You don't have to have it all together. But this is the continual pattern for us as believers. Once you come to faith in Jesus, you continue to bring yourself to him. In Romans uh, 12, 1, it says, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And so daily, as we were reminded with the very first song, daily we present ourselves to the Lord. Daily we bring ourselves to him, uh, knowing that he takes what we bring. And sometimes we bring brokenness. Sometimes we bring hurt. Sometimes we bring struggle. And he takes that as well. Jesus himself uh, says, come to me all who, are, who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. We bring whatever, whatever is going on in us and in our lives, we bring it to him. We offer it to him. And then we see the next thing, which Jesus blesses. He blesses and he gives thanks for what you bring to him. Now, the reason I have blessed, blessed he blesses here is because that's literally what Jesus did when he prayed. Uh, what he would have prayed when he had that bread uh, was a typical Jewish prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And for the cup, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings fruit from the vine. That's the blessing. That's the blessing on the food. And Jesus blesses those who come to him. Um, in, in John chapter 17, we have the account of Jesus praying. The whole chapter is Jesus praying. It's referred to as the high priestly prayer in which Jesus is praying for his disciples, knowing that he's going to go to the cross and die, and they're going to be confused, and they're going to need some help from the Holy Spirit. And he prays even for those who come after. That is, he prays for us. And the Bible tells us that Jesus right now as the resurrected king is sitting at the right hand of God the Father praying for us. He's carrying on intercession for us. And in John chapter 17, you get a glimpse of what Jesus wants for you and me, how he wants to bless us. It says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know 
that you sent me and loved me even as you, as you loved me. What's Jesus praying for? He's praying that, uh, first of all, that we might uh, receive his glory, that he might be in us so that we might be one with one another as he is one with God the Father and that we might know that we are loved by God as he is loved uh, by God. I don't know if any of you have observed this or not, but at least in, in my yard, um, the violets have come up along with the grass getting green. Anybody else notice that? And um, violets always bring back some special memories for me. Uh, because uh, when we would go and visit my grandparents, uh, when I was just a little shaver, I would go out and in the yard and I would pick violets. And I would bring them in to my grandmother. And my grandmother made over those violets like I had bought her, uh, you know, uh, a dozen red roses or uh, presented her with some expensive piece of jewelry you would have thought it was the best gift she had ever gotten and she always had a narrow topped vase that she would put them in and she would put them prominently in the center of the dining room table. And she made me feel like I had just given her the best thing ever and what I did was I picked flowers that were not cultivated. Some people consider them weeds, but in my grandmother's eyes, they were a huge gift. I say that to say this. My grandma had a big heart. And I know, though those violets were not that special, it was her grandson who presented them that mattered in this situation. And I want to tell you, God has a vastly bigger heart than my grandma. And when you present to him, when you give to him, anything your heart your life your struggles your joys your sorrows you fill in the blank he sings over you he loves you that much he delights in you and so we're to bring and he blesses and we feel that blessing we feel that blessing as a reflection of the relationship and the connection to him. That's what he's praying about, that they might be one as we are one, that there's that connection um, within uh, the Lord Jesus. So Jesus takes what we bring, he blesses, and he also breaks what you bring. Now, this is a hard one for us. Um, but it's also true that there's some breaking or there's some uh, work that has to be done in each of our lives. Anybody here perfect? Good. We don't have to have that conversation. Um, we, we all have areas to grow. Now, we seem to understand that in the physical realm a, a whole lot more than we do in the spiritual realm. Because if you, if you go to the gym, you might hear this mantra, no pain, no gain. No gain. So we understand that uh, the muscles have to be pushed and pressed and stressed so that they grow and get stronger and do what they're supposed to do, right? But in the spiritual realm, a lot of times people think, well, God is like that genie up in the sky and he's just supposed to make everything easy for me. And when things get hard, they second guess whether God is real or what God is doing. And in reality, uh, there are things that, that have to shift and change within us. Now, Jesus, uh, it, it's not like Cleopas and his companion were totally all wrong. They, they believed that Jesus was going to redeem his people. They just thought it was going to be political and military. What they thought actually was they were looking for the Jesus of the second coming 
who would come and rule and reign from Jerusalem and set everything right, rather than Jesus of the first coming. And so Jesus himself had to break their understanding, and it tells us, beginning with Moses and throughout the prophets, uh, he had to teach them about who he was. And he said, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Sometimes for us, the struggle is that we don't fully understand all that God is doing and we have to have that shift, that change. Other times, the struggle can come because we have certain idols in our lives that are more important and God has to break that down. Whatever it may be, there's a breaking that occurs and we have to trust that he ultimately is going to bring about good because that's what his word says. It doesn't say that everything that comes in your life and mine is always good. But what he does promise is this. He'll work all things out for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And in the Old Testament, we have a perfect example of that in Joseph, don't we? When his brothers sold him into slavery and he went to Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife wrongly accuses him and he ends up in, in Pharaoh's prison. And then God delivers him to the point in which he's second in command. And when he saves his whole family and his brothers are fearful that he's going to get revenge, he tells them what you meant for evil, God meant for good. All that difficulty that he went through, there was still a plan. And it was ultimately for good. So Jesus can do that in our lives as well. Take those broken things and bring about something good. And lastly, does, Jesus doesn't just keep it, but he gives it back to us. But when Jesus gives back, it's been transformed. It's been changed. In Colossians 1, 27, it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. When Jesus enters into our life, then our lives are radically changed. There's a beautiful song that the Gaithers wrote. I love the chorus. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful of my life. Now I want us to go back to Cleopas and his companion. They walk that seven mile road back to Emmaus, dejected, defeated, destroyed, and they encounter the living Lord at the table in their house. Um, Jesus does something radical, doesn't he? Um, but he does something typical of Jesus. Uh, undoubtedly, they've, they've been in Jerusalem for a while. I imagine that along that seven mile uh, hike, uh, somewhere along the line, they stopped and bought some bread because they wouldn't have had any. Uh, we Americans, we, we always got stuff in the freezer, and the refrigerator. They would have had none of that. It was, it was, they would have had to pick up something along the way. And then they invite him into their house to share a meal. And they sit down. And who takes charge? Jesus. He's at their house, and he becomes the host. And he takes the bread, and he blesses the bread and he breaks the bread, and he gives it to them, and that's when their eyes are open. That's when they see him. They see him as the host, the one who's dispensing the blessing and dispensing the food so that they can fellowship uh, with one another. It's a perfect picture of the Savior to come because he's going to be the host at the wedding feast. He's still that same Jesus that operates that way, and he... Uh, he does the same uh, in our lives. And then he disappears. And those guys who have already walked seven miles quickly now rush back to Jerusalem. Those defeated people are now bold witnesses 
that hunt down the disciples to say, we've seen him. He's risen. We met him. In the breaking of the bread around the table. The closing verse that I wanted to share with you is often used uh, for evangelism, uh, but really it was written to the church. These are the words of Jesus uh, to the church. And he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. He says, If you open your life to me, I'll have fellowship with you. It was back in 1998. In my previous church, um, when I invited uh, a couple of missionaries from uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship to come and do training with our, our, our children's ministry group, all those volunteers that worked with our children. And they taught us some things about how to teach the kids uh, to memorize and some uh, songs that were very good uh, to help them grab a hold of Bible truths. And then they shared something called the wordless book. I had never heard of the wordless book until uh, that missionary presented it. And, and it starts with a gold page. And as the story goes, so what does gold remind you of? Well, gold reminds us of, of coins, jewelry, wealth, those kind of things. That's right. Um, and gold can remind us of heaven because the Bible tells us that the streets of gold are, are, are there. And God wants everybody there with him. And so uh, that's where God wants us. But we all have a problem that keeps us from that. And this dark page represents what's in each of our hearts, that we've disobeyed God and, and that the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And this can keep us from being in heaven. And there is nothing we can do to fix that in our own lives. But God, out of his love, sent his son Jesus to take care of that, that darkness, that sin, that wrong that we've done. And that's why Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Um, he gave his blood as the sacrifice. He took the punishment that we deserve. And if we trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then God does this miracle in our hearts and he cleans us all up so that we can go to heaven and be with him. It's a simple presentation of the gospel for children. And then... As you pray and read the Bible every day, you grow like green grass. And that was, that was a great presentation. Our, uh, our children's ministry, um, they, they all appreciated that. And uh, that evening, uh, when we were sitting at our kitchen table after dinner, I said to my kids, have you ever heard of a wordless book? My kids grew up, I mean, they were little, but we read to them every day without fail. Um, and they loved books. They didn't know anything about a wordless book. I went through this simple presentation. Both of our kids were very young. At the end of it, I, I just presented it. I wasn't asking for a decision. I wasn't asking for anything. And Justin said, Daddy, I want to do that. I said, what do you want to do? I want Jesus to make my heart like this. And Emily said, I want to do that too. I share that because it was at a table in our house in the context of a meal, just being family. I didn't think that that day I would lead my children to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I was just presenting what I had learned that day. Jesus wants to be in your life and mine, in our homes, in our everyday encounters. All we have to do is invite him in 
and see what he will do. And I'm telling you, he does some pretty amazing things. Pray with me, would you? Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you that you enter in to life in the commonest of ways, in table fellowship, in talking over the truth of Scripture, and showing love and extending blessing. And Lord God, I pray that as we prepare our hearts to share in the Lord's Supper, that you would just help us in these moments when we listen to a song that reminds us we should remember. Lord, I pray that all of us would meet with you, that we would bring ourselves to you, that we would offer up any concerns, our praises, our thanksgivings, our struggles, whatever it is, and allow you to take it, allow you to bless, allow you to break and give back to us an even greater form through fellowship and love with you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, how could it be that my God would welcome me into this mystery? Say, take this bread and take this wine, now the simple made divine. For any to proceed by your mercy we come to your table by your grace you are making us faithful we remember you and remembrance leads us to worship and as we Leads us to worship, and 
invitation is for us to remember him and the sacrifice that he made. Um, this remembrance is not exclusively to First Baptist Church. This is for all believers who have trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. On that night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. Take in remembrance of me. And after the meal, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Take in remembrance of me. Amen. Our relationship with the Lord Jesus starts with us surrendering to him and our relationship continues to grow as we surrender to him. Our closing hymn is, um, I Surrender All. And as we stand and sing this uh, hymn, I invite you. Maybe there's someone here this morning who, um, who needs to, like my little children did at one time, say, I want what Jesus has for me. I want him to change my life. I want him to clean my heart. Maybe some here this morning, maybe you're struggling with something, something you just need to lay down and you just need to surrender it. You feel free. God is here to meet with you. We have prayer counselors that are available for you. All of us, whether you respond or whether you're just singing and worshiping, do business with the Lord, I pray. Let's stand and sing together.
pray with me, would you? Oh, Lord God, we marvel at the, the mystery and the marvelous irony of the kingdom of God that when we surrender to you, we win. We thank you that um, through your life, we have new life, everlasting life, a life that is full and full of your blessings. Lord, send us forth as Cleopas and the companion throughout this week. Help us be full of the joyful message that we have experienced and know a risen Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching Joy for the Journey, a presentation of worship from the First Baptist Church of Mattoon, Illinois. To learn more about the ministries of our church, learn how you can join us in worship, or to support this television ministry, contact us at 1804 South 9th Street, Mattoon, Illinois, 61938. You can also visit us at our website, www.fbcmattoon.org. First Baptist Church, a family for everyone.